Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whenever you're watching this, welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to review group influences on behavior and mental processes. As we continue to review Unit 9, Topic 4 of AP Psychology, we as people are constantly being influenced by other individuals, situations, and events. Sometimes these influences can be quite apparent, but other times we may not realize we are being influenced until after our behavior has changed. For instance, we can observe a phenomenon known as social facilitation, which is when a group of people are together, they start to perform better. For example, we can often see this concept play out at sporting events, particularly with the home team. They become more motivated as a group and perform better surrounded by fans who are cheering them on. In this situation, the individuals in the group did not perform better due to the skills or talents of one person. Rather, it is the group as a whole. One other similar term that I want to highlight is social inhibition, which is when an individual changes their behaviors, comments, and or personality to better match the social setting in which they are in, which can be a positive or a negative depending on the situation and the individual. For instance, I would bet that you act different at a family holiday party than you do at school with your friends, or if you're at prom with your friends. Your behaviors and comments change depending on the situation. Now, groups do not always increase performance. We can also see de-individualization occur and group polarization when individuals get together in larger groups. De-individuation is when an individual has a temporary loss of their self-awareness. Essentially, the individual gets swept up in the group think and acts with the group and forgets about their own individual agency. Going back to our sports example, we could see a de-individuation happen with fans. For example, a ref makes a couple questionable calls in a game and before you know it, the people in the stands are furious. Eventually, you find yourself yelling at the refs, cursing, and getting rowdy with the rest of the crowd. Now, group polarization, on the other hand, is when people's opinions, thoughts, and or actions become more extreme extreme in a group setting. This generally happens when people are surrounded by other like-minded people and a situation, talk, activity, or discourse continues to ramp up. So we can see how powerful a group can be and how it can influence and impact an individual. Now another powerful phenomenon we see occur in larger groups is a diffusion of responsibility. When individuals are in a group, they start to feel less responsible for certain actions. People often spread responsibility out between the larger group. This can lead to the bystander effect to occur, which is the idea that people are less likely to help someone else when they are in a larger group. The reason being because the individual's responsibility has been diffused through the larger group. For instance, if you are on a busy road and you notice a car crash on the side of the road, you are more likely to assume that someone else has already called 911 since there are so many other drivers. But if you are driving on a road with hardly any other cars and come across a crash, you'll be more likely to call 911 since you will be more likely to take on the responsibility. The next concept I want to review is in-group and out-group bias, which occurs when we are dealing with different people and situations who are either in our same social groups or different than ours. In-group bias refers to the tendency of an individual to give preferential treatment or look favorably at other individuals who are part of one's own group, while out-group bias refers to the tendency of an individual to judge, use stereotypes, or harbor negative attitudes about other individuals who are are part of another group. Essentially, individuals that are in our in-group we often look at more favorably and judge them less harshly, while individuals that are not part of that group we are more likely to judge harshly and will be quicker to look down on. Two other concepts that you will want to understand are reciprocatory norms and social norms. With reciprocatory norms, think about how every action has a reaction. A reciprocatory norm is when one person does a positive or negative thing to another person and they do a similar action back. For example, you give your friend a gift for their birthday and they will most likely feel obligated to give you one back on your birthday. On the other hand, there is social norms, which are unwritten rules in society. These impact people's beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. These are things that are considered acceptable and normal by a culture, group, or society. If you break a social norm, you will most likely experience discomfort and will stand out in society. For instance, holding the door open for someone who is behind you or shaking someone with your right hand and not your left. So we can see that the power of the group is strong and it definitely does influence us as individuals. 
Now, before we transition this video to game theory, I want to highlight two more terms. The first being social traps. These happen when individuals are competing and they make certain choices that benefit them in the short run, but reduce their long-term benefit and utility. In these situations, people make decisions in the now without thinking about the consequences of tomorrow, such as the time you were texting your friend about the drama happening at school during your psych class, which allowed you to get all that sweet tea, but caused you, of course, to completely miss the teacher talking about your upcoming test. That is tomorrow, and now you're not aware of. The last term is concerned less about how the group impacts our actions and more about our goals as individuals or as groups. When people work together with other individuals, they gain access to other people's knowledge, skills, and experiences. This can help improve outcomes for not just the larger group, but for each individual in the group as well. Oftentimes we can see people's goals align together with other individuals' goals. When this happens, it can create a superordinate goal. This is a goal that supersedes other goals. Here, two or more individuals work together in a group to achieve a larger common goal. For instance, say we have two different cities that are fighting over water rights. One community wants to use more water for agricultural purposes, while the other wants to use more water for recreational activities. Water in the region has become more scarce due to a severe drought, so the two cities come together to improve water conservation techniques for both cities. Here, the groups focus on the larger goal and come together to solve it. All right, the time now has come to finish this video with some good old-fashioned game theory, which looks to see at what decisions an individual will make and how those decisions will impact others. One famous example of this is the prisoner's dilemma. On the screen right now, you can see the matrix. This is known as the prisoner's dilemma. Say that person A and person B have been caught by the police for vandalizing the local mall. They have caused a lot of damage and the police have some evidence pointing to both of the people, but not enough for them to fully put them away. The police put the two people in two different rooms to talk to them. The following is the possible outcomes that could happen. On the left, we have person A, who can either remain silent and cooperate with the other person, or they can betray the other person and defect. On the top, we can see that person B has the same option. Let's say person A remains silent and person B remains silent. This would make it so the police could only prove minor crime, and both individuals will only serve one year in prison. Now let's say that person A remains silent, but person B betrays person A and rats them out. In this scenario, person B would be awarded for helping the police police and would get to go home while person A would do four years in prison. Here we can see we have great outcomes for person B, but not so much for person A. All right, now let's say that person A decides that they are going to betray person B and rat them out. And at the same time, person B remains silent. Well, here we can see that person A gets to go free and person B gets four years in prison. Lastly, we have a scenario where person A and person B both betray each other. This results in them both getting two years in prison. This matrix can be applied to a variety of different scenarios, such as different social settings, business strategies, marketing techniques, and more. But the real question is based on this matrix. What is the most likely outcome to happen in this situation? Well, we can see that it is most likely that both of the people will betray each other, since this is the only strategy where the people do not risk being worse off. Now you might be saying, well, hold on, Mr. Sin. If they both cooperate and remain silent, they only have to spend one year in prison. Or if one of them remains silent and the other betrays them, they can go home. How is that not better? Well, think about it. If person A or B decides to remain silent and cooperate, their best outcome is one year in prison but their worst outcome is four years in prison. There's more risk and downside to cooperate, but if they betray the other, the worst case scenario is two years in prison. But the best case scenario is they get to go home. So no matter what, both people should betray one another. So there you have it. Another topic review video is done. Now remember, if you need more help with your AP psychology class, check out my ultimate review packet. It is a phenomenal resource that'll help you get an A in your class and a five on the national exam. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.